Liam, great to see you. Great to see you, John. Um, it's great to have you back with the sixth album from the Cortinas. Yeah. And this is a tradition now. I mean, people have been anticipating this for a few weeks now yeah. by Twitter, which is yeah, very been exciting. Talking about it, yeah. I mean, we're bound to let them down. <laughs> but I don't know about that. I mean, Heart <laughs> Attack, what a great way to start an album. You know, straight, straight like in, a punch in the face. Straight at them. Yeah, I listened to it before when I was on the train. And uh, it, people say this, and it's not usually true, but this, I mean, you, maybe you can tell. This is the quickest song I've ever written. It, it was the last thing we did for the album. And it's so funny how sometimes that, like the last thing that you do, you feel like it needs to be at the beginning or near the beginning because it feels the freshest, I guess. Right. And so very quick, did it in one day. This is like, kind of, this is the demo. Wow. We just didn't redo it because it sounded that good. It was just like, well, just leave it. Um, I mean, that is amazing because if your demos sound this big, <clears throat> as big as honest, Heart Attack. Hon honest to God, honestly. Um, we we just, I think we we had like the kind of bigger moments and the, not even like the singles necessarily, but thematically, et cetera. I had bits and bobs that I thought, I've got it, but I wouldn't mind something... I don't want to say throwaway, but something that was aggressive enough to grab your attention, but, you know, wasn't super serious in subject matter or whatever. A light-hearted kick in the teeth, perhaps, we should say. <laughs> <laughs> Just something that grabs your attention, but didn't necessarily weigh you down. And um, I don't know if you know the song Fried My Little Brains by The Kills. Yes, that, I do. So that, yeah. that's... A lot of guitarists will have... Like, I mean, oh, look, I'm not speaking for every guitarist uh, in the land here, but it's, in my band at least, there's a few things that you always play, right? And every time I pick up a new guitar, I always play Fried My Little Brains Valley because it's a really simple riff, like, round, down, down, down. And so I've always toyed, that riff is like my go to, it's so simple, but it's just my go to every time I pick up a guitar. So I just, I was just riffing, <laughs> sorry, I was playing that riff, I was riffing on that riff. And, um, and yeah, it just went from there. Very easy, very quick. All the percussion, the majority of the percussion, is me on a, a flight case. Wow. I, like I that, can't believe it because it sounds like a sounds big massive, glitter stomp, yeah, like a does, big lambtastic yeah, it's number. Just, it's just a demo. And um, we just made it sound big. I think we, we might end up opening with this, I think. The actual shows, you know, yeah. like when we... And we go live. Well, that's. So. I mean, it's a great way to open an album. I mean, mm. the, the first couple of tracks are like that. And I like that idea that you grab people's attention mm. immediately. Mm. And, uh, you know, we're stomping along. We've got fists in the air. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds fantastic. And and you say it's a, a kind of light-hearted uh, punch in the face. Uh, but, yeah. I but mean, do you know what? Is it an attack on somebody? I mean, who are you describing in there? No, um, I don't know. What, what are the lyrics again? Uh, I don't know. It's like the silver spoons and the... The expensively educated, they get a few digs on this record. Mm. Why not? They all deserve it. So, so, so. <laughs> um, what else is there? Oh, yeah. Rolos get a name check. Do they still make Rolos? I I'm assuming yes. But... but I bet they taste rubbish, right? I, I... Everything's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate has gone down the pan. Well, I mean, I'm sure that's an opinion thing. But, yeah, no. yeah, maybe. But yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of... Um, I've got a bit of a mind blank. It's weird because I just listened to it from start to finish before. And it's the first time I've listened to the record in... Because you have to put it in a box, I think. Once, Almost once you've done it and it's finished and it's mixed and mastered. Because you can't do anything with it. Mm. And I just listen to it and this is going to sound really bad. I'm not going to dispel any of those big-headed rumours, but I just thought, yeah, this sounds good. This. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound good, I've got to say. But it's good to have I'm that reassurance. I'm pleased with it, yeah. Because well, you, I guess once you've finished it, all you do is drown in self-doubt <laughs> that it's not good enough. So it was kind of nice to listen to it on the train. And I love listening to things on the train. Mm -hmm. All the tram, any mode of transport. But just when you're on the move, I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a great one. I don't sit at home with the headphones on. I have to be moving. So, I'll, I, yeah, I'm a big one for when I'm on the train or when I'm walking, somewhere I'm running, whatever. I love that. Um, but, yeah, I kept trying to think, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, fingers and all that on the assembly lines. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, because you always have, I think you've got a great turn of phrase. You know, you always come up with these these quips and these bon mots. Um, <laughs> and do these things come to you in the spur of the moment, say, when you're writing Heart Attack, or, or are these things that you collect? More than any other record, these lyrics 
came last. L not this job, this song, the whole thing. I think I've always been lyrics first. I'm always in my phone. I'm always in my notes, notebook. Um, and yeah, this time it wasn't like that. I, I don't know why. I'm we'll probably get into that in a bit, but yeah, a lot of it was was music first, and it was unusual that f for the, the way that I work. But um, it it worked, mm. and it, it wasn't like yeah, it didn't feel that different, I suppose. So yeah, my, yeah, a lot of them were like were, were spur of the moment actually, but. Okay, I don't want to don't want to use up all this gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite, but when I mean? and where and and how? <laughs> when did you start the album and, and where where was that? Should we Remember do that? Should we do that now? Yeah, yeah. yeah we can do that now, or we yeah. could go into Heavy Jacket. Um, but, I mean, there's always so much to talk about each song. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, we could do it off Heavy Jacket. Yeah. yeah okay. 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 So tell us about Heavy Jacket. Then. Okay. I and mean, this is another stomper. Yeah, big time. Uh, this was this was one of the first things that I did. I wrote I wrote the thing on it. You can't really hear the piano in it. I wish we'd have made the piano beat. I mean, retrospect, right? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Oh, it's a mixed thing. But I was on the piano and I can't really play the piano. I think I've said this before. I can write on it, but I can't really play it. But I was just doing the octave of this, like, da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba I just like this, like, little, this jarring note at the end. I thought, that's good. And it's pretty difficult to sing to get your breath. It just felt really hooky and straight away I was like, I might be onto something. Um... So yeah, it's pretty explosive. Again, I knew that had to go at the beginning of the record. Um, and I always hear Mark it as the first thing people should hear as well. I, I guess because it's a bit of a monster. But the, yeah, the, the lyrics in it, it's, just, it's kind of a three or four things in one. It doesn't really follow. It's not like your typical songwriter song, I don't think. Mm. Um, it's not going to win any Ivan Avellos, I don't think. But, but it's just a bit mad. The whole, the old, the old thing, uh, what's the word? I can't remember. Like, the heavy jacket, I guess, was like this kind of hard shell and this armoury against, against loads of things, that, really, if I'm being honest. But, I don't know, like, maybe it was me saying about, like, getting recognised more. I don't want to say fame, because I'll just get hounded. But, you know, like... We do get recognised now. We the last few records, more and more and more. And I, I don't know. Like I'm a pretty private person, so you do have to like, I kind of put on this exterior shell, I guess. Um, but then there was a lot of there was stuff like. So that's I guess that's like this is not your home anymore. Uh, reaping what it's oh, we can't have it both ways. You've got to do these big gigs and. You're gonna get hassle, aren't you? Yeah, well, so, well, popularity yeah, comes with yeah, its own yeah, 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 yeah. burden. And, and in no way am I saying get the violins out, but I think it's diff it's just weird when you have when you start adapting that, and because we very look, we're not millionaires and we don't have seven security guards, so and I don't have a driver outside my house taking me, you know, to A, B, and C. So you, I live like an extremely normal life. When that starts creeping into your normal life, it's a you know, dread up a bit. So. Um, there was that, and then yeah, again the silver spoons get a bit of a dig. Um, but in terms of, I mean, again, it has this kind of stomping glam mm -hmm. feel yeah. to it. I mean, you know, and with the sirens, I immediately think of the sweet. Um, but I think that's because of right. a certain era and okay. um, blockbuster. Because and, and yeah. you know, it just sounds big. We thought again. that sound great live, and when we we. So this, I think what's quite interesting about this song is we played it, we did a, a tour last December. And I don't think we've played any new songs on a tour to, you know, to the to the fans, to the crowds. For, for a long time, since Falcon almost. And obviously like phones are awful then. Phones are a bit better now. And the, the phone at gigs thing, it's, I don't really care. If someone's going to take a video of a song we've written and it's a decent video and put it up put it up I don't care hmm. you know there's other things to worry about in the world than all that I think but um, look I get it if it's a small intimate gig and there's 100 people like that in your face it's different but it, you know video started circulating with this cloud and better man on that last tour and uh, it was unusual from one night to the next people every night there was a a pocket of people, then there was like 
another pocket, and then those pockets became one pocket on the fourth night. And, you know, by the end of the tour, it's a few hundred people at the front, and that's you know, it just felt really uh, old school, if you like. Yeah, we're all going crazy to heavy jack. Well, I wouldn't say going crazy, but because that it really is a crowd thing. Like if no one else is is bouncing up and down, you're not gonna. It's a bit like oh, oh if they're not really into it, I'm not. But singing the words, if they've learnt the words of a video, and I mean, I'm loving that, that's great. So we really got an indication quite early on that people were into, like, say, for, for instance, those three songs. Mm. Um, a bit of a risk, I think. And also it's a bit of a risk for the show as a whole because you don't want to let that drop. So it's pretty brave to do that, I think, especially because the majority of our songs, they are going, for want of a better phrase, bananas. Yeah. And so to bring that down at certain points is... I say brave, it could be suicidal, but it was, you know, it was it, it was good once we'd done it. It felt like, okay, yeah. So More Again Forever, the title track. Yeah. And it's quite an epic number. It's a, it's a kind of really interesting tale to a, a kind of disco beat. The yep. bass sounds fantastic. I love that g- cascading guitar line that you've got in there. And I yeah. love the way it builds. And that kind of brave um, decision to, to tell a story, to just speak um, throughout the whole track. I think this is my favourite, you know. Really? I think this is my favourite. Yeah, um, it. You, you, you never write a song thinking this is going to be different, and we're going to really test people's, uh, you know, fandom here to see if they've really been us off or if they stick with us. I've, I wrote a lot of this record on the bass, starting you know from the bass and working up, and this is the best example of that, I guess. And what's annoying for Joe when he comes to play the bass is that I play the bass like I play the guitar. So it causes a few issues when there's like, you know, not that he can't play it, but, you know, there are, but I think that kind of makes it interesting as well. Like when I know a few guitarists that when they play the bass, the bass is a very difficult instrument to play and I wouldn't make out, I could, you know, couldn't do the bass for a whole gig because I just want to go somewhere else. It's a lot of, it's like being a drummer, you know, you you have to be disciplined Mm. And, you know, stay within the parameters where a guitarist can do what they want, you know. Selfish. Showboats. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, and... Um, but, yeah, I got the title, More Again Forever. I think it's the first time we've ever done a song of the album as well, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So that was quite interesting. But I got the title from a book called... Um, oh, my God, what's it called? The Recovering. Uh, which be by a woman called Leslie Jameson, I think, about uh, giving up uh, alcohol. Um, and I was in America last year, uh, and I'd just given up booze for like a couple of months because I'd never done it before. And I think if you're a touring musician, it's just like expected that you you you're on the booze all the time. And you, I mean, you kind of are when you're touring. I don't drink at all anymore before I go on stage. I've not done that for years. Um, more than make up for it when we come off. <laughs> but I had, I just, I don't touch it anymore before I go on. Um, I mean, I might have to just a whiskey just before we go on, kind of thing. But um, your pipes can't handle it. And people that think they can, the liars, and they're, you know, they've never sung before. <clears throat> um, any proper singer who's doing it all the time will not be boozing before they go on. And you ask anybody in a band and they'll say the same thing. And if they don't, uh, I don't know. Well, maybe they've just got different throats to mine. Um, uh, that is also a different thing because people talk from different parts of the, of the voice and some people mm. talk from up here and mine is very much there. So if you're talking all the time, like I am all the time, yeah. <laughs> then that takes its talk kind of thing. Anyway, sorry, I digress. I got this book and I saw that phrase written down, not even knowing what it meant. It just looked great. More full stop, again, full stop forever. I was like, that's such a great phrase. Um, and it can be applied to anything, especially like now. And there's that um, 1975 quote uh, song, to quote my uh, good friend, Matt Healy, um, when they say, you know, we want the food now and the girls now and whatever. And it's true, innit? Everybody wants everything now. We want it now. Social media, everything. Everything's too easy, but... Uh, I was applying it directly, I suppose, to drink. And when you have that first one, it's supposed to come for one. There is, and I heard I heard Liam say this, Liam Gallagher, that, uh, on another interview, and it's totally true. One, you can't do one. I mean, some people can do one, but some people can't. And it's not a... It's like it's in your brain, do you know what I mean? Like, I've seen people about it. It's not like 
you can't say no, you've got no self-restraint. It's like, well, it's a thing up there. Do you know what I mean? So it's like people say you can't handle it. No, the trouble is, can handle it. Can handle it too well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, totally. So, totally. I mean, it, we, we've had a bit of this conversation probably, before. Because yeah. yeah, you've yeah. talked about it before, about that yeah. idea that, you know, you, two drinks, if you go for a third, then yeah. you're finished. Oh, no. curtains. Because that's, that's the rest of the night. Yeah. And I mean, but, and it's stranger because it, after the first, after the first one, like you, what do you call it? Like you, you control or restraint or whatever it is up here starts to wane after each drink. Um, so I, I just thought I've never really given booze up. Uh, I don't, I've always, I've never, never needed to or wanted to, and I did it. This so this was 2018. I did like seven weeks, and I, I thought. I mean, it's always easier in January, isn't it? Because people do dry January. It wasn't that. I just thought I'm going to see what it's like if I can do it for a start. I thought if I can't do it, then that might be a bit of an issue. But it's seven weeks, and um, yeah, it, it was insane. It was insane. I thought, is this what my brain is like? Because uh, the words were coming out, I was flying, like in the studio, I was doing so much. Um, which part of me thinks, is that pretty sad then, that normally you're only operating at like 50%? But then I was like, yeah, but the other 50% is pretty good, isn't it, when you go out? So. <laughs> there is that, there is that. But it's good to know that I could do it. Yeah. And I think I'll do it a lot. Like I think... You know, to, to say you can have six weeks off or a month off or even two weeks off, do you know what I mean? Nobody gives up booze for two weeks and say they don't feel great. They do, everyone knows that. I think the more people that kind of say it, like I'm not saying don't go to the pub and don't have a good time, don't go to the football, I'm not saying any of that. But find me someone who gave up booze for two or three weeks and didn't feel better, you find a liar, do you know what I mean? Because you just do. And I think those goalposts are shifting as well. Um, you know... The 90s sound like a great time, but I believe there was a big hangover from it. Yeah. And it, it just don't, we just don't live like that anymore, do we? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's always these shifting um, demographics of, of and trends within uh -huh. different generations yeah. Yeah. and you know one trend that's been identified is that uh, a younger generation, maybe between you know 16 and 25, mm -hmm. a big percentage of that generation yeah. are not interested in alcohol. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's weird. And we've kind of like, we've, strad we've straddled like almost like kind of three, I think almost three eras in my mind. Like we came in right at the back end of that. Right at the back end. I think we, uh, the hangover, if you like, of say like the Libertines and that, you know, that kind of new rock revolution. Where now I look back, I'm going, no wonder we got hammered when we came out because people must have been going, another one of these bands. We don't need another one of these bands, which that kind of breaks your heart when you see it written down. And you get dismissed as like land. I hate that term landfill indie, which I'm assuming what the Guardian made up, I presume. I hate that term. Because it's tagged on to people who are usually from the north and are usually working class. So it's a classist term in my eyes. Um, I don't know. Again, a digress, John. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, more again forever. I mean, this is yeah, a, a disco sorry. track, isn't it? With yeah. uh, this amazing bass line, which you said, you know, you you created. You were playing the bass, and it informed yeah. a lot of the songs. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. The the story that you tell from I, I'm yeah. assuming it's from a female perspective. Well, to be honest, it was kind. Of, no, it was from my perspective. Right. Okay. So that is you yeah, out yeah, out yeah. and about. Hundred uh, percent. Thinking the bartender was sexy. I'm allowed right. to. I'm yeah, allowed, okay. I'm, I'm allowed enough. to pass that judgment. Yeah. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell when someone's got it. Um, and I, I don't know. I, can, I, I was talking to someone years ago, and there's a book apparently called The Game, which just made me feel. I just was just like, "You're kidding me." And I think it's about going to pick up girls. Mm. And there's always been a bit of that. Like cavorting was a bit like that, where you'd look at the guys. Again, I think people got that the wrong way around, as if it was like. I was looking at those guys who were in those bands, who were after those girls, and even then taking a bit of that stance. But it got lost because, again, I think they kind of went for us with the pitchforks and they got it. They got us a bit wrong, maybe. I don't know, whatever. It's not a sob story. But yeah, I think it was just a bit of a take on that kind of culture and that you see it in bars and stuff, and it, it just makes me sick. And, um, but it's exciting to do it. It's a tough one. I think it's going to be tough. I think to connect live. Mm. I think it's my favorite on the album. I think it says a lot about what we're willing to go as well. You know, like you can have a couple of them on each record. I think to alleviate the 
Mm, oh, I don't want to say the monotony, but you know what it's like. You need a couple of singles. You need a few songs to uh, satiate the fan base's appetite, I guess. But you need you need enough to keep you interested and in pushing it forward, you know. Mm. So it's like, I guess maybe it's like the last album, 17th or something like that. Um, but we never set out like that. To be honest, I think I was finding it difficult to pitch because um, the bass line is repetitive. I didn't want to throw a load of guitar chords in there to kind of try and go somewhere else. I thought, I like this bass line too much. And I, I think I think we might have toyed around with, with trying to do uh, a sung vocal. I just couldn't find where to pitch it. I thought, oh, you know what? I'll just I'll just speak these lyrics and then we put it in. I thought, that's quite unusual. Like, let's just keep it. And the chorus lifts off. Mm. Do you know what I mean? The chorus is a big lift off. So... Um, but live, it's going to be... We've tried it a few times, and whether the audience enjoy it as much as we like. I don't know. It's one of I, those, isn't it? But I think... I mean, I think, that think the, the, music, the music will get them. Yeah, maybe. And, and they'll be drawn in. But also, I mean, I've found the more I listen to it, um, the better it gets. I and mean, I liked it from the mm. off, but... I, you know, because you're kind of expecting the next phrase, you're expecting the next yeah. sentence, and and you're kind of getting involved, and also because you know what's going on, you yeah. kind of you feel like you're there and you're oh. you're walking through the crowd and yeah. you're having this reaction yourself. You yeah. Know? Well, I tell you what, as well, I have to give Campbell a, a lot of props on this because we wanted it to be kind of LCD, so dancey in that world, but with that human element. So there's a lot of like small things that you just tell that the drums are real, you know, mm. where the, the, the high hats will climb ever so gently or, you know, or, you know, whatever it is, or when you're on the 16th and you can hear that there's tiny, tiny imperfections that we wanted to keep in that shows it's, you know, that it's Campbell rather than it's a metronomic, you know, you know, program beat or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but no, yeah, really pleased with this. And yeah, pleased the reaction actually as well. Like people dig it. And once you get into that, that that feels like such a not a safe place. Like almost like it, it feels good because you've gone to that place that isn't your safe place, and people have respected it and gone, yeah, actually, I'm quite dig this. Now that's got to be symptomatic of the times where people are just more open to listening to different things because you couldn't have done this five years ago. So you need to, I guess, you know, be be confident in your output and whatever. Um, but it's a two-way street, I think, because you're not you're not anything unless the people want to come and watch you and if they want to buy the records, etc. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you don't want to write 15, not 19, and write to committee. So it's a balancing act, isn't it? But it, it feels it feels like they're on board now with us experimenting a bit more, which is great for us, you know, because it means that right, well, that door's just been kicked down, that door's just been kicked down, you know. So, you know, there's more doors to kick down over there. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it's interesting, you know, with, with the new record, and we just heard the title track, the record starts with two big glam stompers. Yeah. Then you go into the disco zone, and then with Better Man, which yeah. is the next song, mm. it's different again. I mean, you keep it upbeat, yep. um, but this has, I, I guess, more of a, a Smith's feel to yeah. it, possibly. I, think that, I was listening to a lot of R.E.M. as well. Right, yeah, um, I can see I like, love Michael Stabb, love his lyrics. I just love how, like, deep he is, but, like, doesn't feel maudlin. A lot of the time, you like even like night swimming, which doesn't a song doesn't really go when you kind of like a repetitive thing, but I don't know anyway. A lot, lot of REM, um, and it's pretty clear that it's a lot of, more of an homage, I guess. Um, this is this kind of encapsulates the kind of theme of the record for me. I feel if I'm allowed to say that without being, I mean, we are here, aren't we talking about it? So, yeah, 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 you've got to well, do it. I may as well say it, John. Um, yeah, I, I went through, I'll touch on this now and then I won't, like I said, I won't get the violins out, but I went, I thought, I was quoted as saying writer's block a couple of weeks ago, but it, it wasn't writer's block, it was more than that. It was, I don't really know how to articulate it, it was, um, it's kind of just like a black hole where you just like, is this what I should be doing? And... And as most people will probably call it turning 30, do you know what I mean? They're <laughs> going like, what am I still doing in a band to get a real job? But it, it was kind of like, am I just going to do another record and then we go and tour it and then we have some time off? And then in your time off, you you know, you get these, like, you can feel these depressive episodes kind of, like, I can see them coming, like, over the hill. I'm like, oh, no, no, you know what I mean? You've got nothing on. And I'm so, uh, what's the word, like, I need to be doing stuff. I need to be around people. I need to be doing stuff. 
and you're on tour and it's going great and all this and then that, that finishes and you drop off a cliff and then you leave it a couple of weeks and it's like, oh God, you know, and then you think, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this and it was a long time, I'd say it was a few months maybe, I can't pinpoint when but you've got stuff booked in so you've got to do that radio thing or you've got to, and you end up you end up basically sometimes I, I'm really good at hiding it so there's a lot of stuff that'd be going on here and you'll go on a stage and I don't know, and let's say Glastonbury and go ah. and parties like this this is you don't even feel this it's not go I'm not going on and having a good time etc but there have definitely been times like I would never cancel the gig put it that way mm -hmm. I don't think I ever will um <clears throat> But there have definitely been times where it's like, I, I'm not up for this today. I can't do it. But you haven't got a choice. You're not letting people who've paid to come and see you down. So you, you turn it on and you do it. But then it's in a weird way, then that makes you feel better because you're like, wow, this is incredible. I think I'm guess I'm talking about more of the times when you're off and the gigs aren't there and there's people knocking on, um, knocking on your phone <laughs> saying... When is this going to be ready? And it's like, well, I've not really got much to write about. I don't really feel in a in a space, and I've never had that before. So I don't think it was writer's block. It was. It felt deeper than that. I've had writer's block before. That doesn't bother me because mm. I just end up cop copying someone else until something comes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was really weird. And at this point, I feel like I should give um, Rich Turvey a big shout out because I don't know if you know Rich. Rich has done a lot of work. Um, he worked with James Skelly, so he did mm. the last Coral album, he's done Blossoms records. So we, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends and acquaintances and stuff up north. And um, I went to see him and just, just I just thought, I'll, I'll, I'll try and work with, because I've worked so closely with, you know, um, Joe for three or four records. I thought, I don't, let me try something else maybe to see if it brings something else out of me, if it brings me out of this. Um, so I think I went in, it might have been early 18, January 18 maybe. Um, and I went in and I think he was going through like a, not a similar thing, uh, but he was like on a, you know, booze free kick kind of thing. So I was like, well, I'm going to try that as well. So we had a bit of a chat and stuff. He said, what do you want to get out of it? I said, well, let's just try and write some tunes. And I didn't, I went in with nothing. I didn't even take my guitar. Because I like that as well. I love going to a studio and going, what have you got? Give me that. I don't want to take my guitars. Give me that 12 string there, that looks great. Or pass me that acoustic bass. Or that's how we wrote Summer. That's how, you know, Sunflower came along, for instance. You just pick up something else and it sounds different because it's not it's not what you know straight away. Do you know what I mean? So I love that. It sparks something else. Um, we sat down. We did Better Man in before lunchtime. It's like that. Wow. I was like, well, there you go then. End of story. And he was brilliant. He just kept pulling stuff out of me. And it was great. Like, I didn't have any words. I did the words in 10 minutes. No joke. We, we had to, we had, so I, he was playing some chords and I just started going, dun, 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 dun. and I thought, that sounds like R.E.M. And I must have done it because I was listening to a lot of R.E.M. So, you know, let's keep going with that. And I played it with a cap on. I tried it up here and thought, it was just, it was just nice to, um, I'd never really done it with anybody before, to be honest. Um, not for the, not because, it's like, it's definitely not an ego thing, which I think meant, you know, people might think maybe. Just because I never had to, because I've always been at home going, life is good, this is fine, this yeah. is what I do. So, do you know what? There was a small part of me, because I'm a bit of a weirdo, that liked it, liked going, you've never been here before. You don't know what this is like. This is like rock bottom almost. Uh, you know, because... I knew that we had stuff booked and gigs and all that and like this record was supposed to be out like last August, last September. Mm. That was the latest because I'd said, no, it'll be done by September, it'll be done by... In fact, it should have been out before that, maybe even April. But it just wasn't right and it wasn't ready. Anyway, back to uh, writing it. Yeah, we had we had the music done before lunchtime um, and I wrote the lyrics in 10 minutes after a, a quick bite. The only, What I do you like about this song is... Uh, trying to be and then when it goes um, whatever that is I added that later on there was just loads of space there I think it might be the next day I got the train up to Liverpool and I was on a bit I like getting when I get off the train I like having a walk before I go you know before I go in yeah I like having like 20 minutes like I say a bit of a weirdo but headphones on 
or up. And I just had this this gap there. And I just said, like, whatever that is, would that fit? Whatever. That's... I thought, yeah, it's perfect. Not just because it fits, because it's so true. Like, what is it? What we're striving for? We're being told all the time that we need to be better. And we do, obviously. Everybody does. Uh, not least, you know, the male of the species. But I just thought, it is, it's a bit, of a bit of a confusing time, I think. You know, if you, especially like if you're a, young, a, younger, a younger guy growing up. Um, I don't want to go into it too deep, but yeah, I think it's, it's right to acknowledge that and also say it's kind of all right to be a bit like, you know, what am I doing, man? Big wide world out there. So yeah. I, I do like that, whatever that is. You know, and you you know, you try and it's not good enough or have you done enough or have you not done enough, you know. I'm asking a lot of questions of the listener, you know. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. Um and we're gonna hear Better Man now though. Um and we'll we'll get on to the next song after it. But um it's really interesting to hear all those little details and the idea that you wrote this so quickly. You wrote the lyrics in ten minutes, but very, then added very, that whatever that is yeah. just as an extra. And it and you're right, it has an impact. It it, it kind of it, it kind of widens the question in a way. Um yeah. and and yeah, it's fantastic. This is interesting. So um, Liam, because what we've learned so far, in some ways, um some of the songs came really easily once they came, and because you went through this period of of uh, self analysis and and frustration in a way. I mean, maybe this is partly down to success, possibly. You know, you you, yep. you achieve so much with the yep. Cortinas, mm -hmm. um, and you kind of reach a point where it's like, well, you no, know, what what what's happening now? You know, mm -hmm. and and because you know, with that success um, become uh, comes commitment and responsibility and things that you have to have to do. And and to, as any writer, whatever they're creating, n will know you need. To, input you need input to get the output you know you need experience yep. for you to come up with ideas and and yeah. songs and and it seems to me that you know you went through that period uh, where you weren't sure what was going on but then when when you put yourself in a position where something could you you could react to something like you did with rich yep. um turvy yep. um then then the goods the yep. goods arrived you know? i think as well it's such a confidence game as well so all you need is that one thing sometimes, that one little spark, you know, maybe a couple or whatever, but once you get that, <clears throat> I was kind of away then, the spikes were on then, I was at the So track. it was Better Man the beginning of the record then, do you think? I think it was the first, yeah, kind of, but it was also, I, I knew we probably had the, like, the, it's like the most single single we've, we've had in a long time, and it because it came so quickly, it was like, there you go, don't overthink it. You're at home thinking... You know, album six, and however many years we've been doing it, oh, God, this has to be this, and this has to do that, and we have to appeal to this, and we shouldn't be trying to appeal to that. Just And then this, you sit down with someone, and the acoustics come out, and you go, that's a great song, mm. out of nothing, out of nowhere. Just very, it relaxed me a lot. And there's a lot of stuff floating around there that just went, you know, yeah. and then off you go then. So yeah. with Hanging Off Your Cloud, I mean, this is different again. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the strings sound absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that the way that you use piano, when I mean, you said earlier on that you don't play piano, but, yeah. you, like, but you like to write on it. <laughs> this one's I easy, mean, though. Yeah, but it sounds, I mean, you know, those, those single notes on the yeah. piano, and, yeah, and they're, they're almost like tears. Yeah. No? <laughs> I, I, yeah, think. I like this one as well. Um, I mean, it sounds fantastic, and it's been getting a great reaction because it was put out there the other day. Um, so where does Hanging Off Your Cloud come into the development of the record? Um, I, th I guess it kind of feels like it's almost like the centerpiece. I can think that and Hang that and Better Man feel like they kind of anchor the other songs in. I guess um, this this song is unusual because I did a <clears throat> I went to um, do a session with a guy from Manchester called Ola who was in Bipolar Sunshine um, with a Deo. He does his own stuff he, and like he's such a talent. He's such a great producer, and a lot of the stuff that he does. Um, is very different from the stuff that I do. But we've been talking for years, and he is such a talent. We've been friends for a while, a long time, actually. Um, and he said, well, come in and we'll, we'll try and do some bits and bobs. And I went in, and we've actually done quite a, a couple of songs together. Like, there's a lot of... He's got a lot of riffs, and I've got a lot of lyrics, and... It just... I just felt like, don't be as guarded about, like, trying to do everything on your own. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um... I don't, there wasn't, there wasn't any um, ego or anything like that. When he said, do you fancy going in? I went in and I, he had, um, I, I actually did have some lyrics for this, but um, 
I, it, this song took a long time. So we, we did like, we did a day where we just bashed out some chords and got like kind of the verse sorted out and whatever. And then I took it away um, and I like did the piano and the strings took forever. But I mean, I love the strings. It's mm. one of the best things. One of the best pieces, I think. So me and Joe did the strings together um, at his place in Manchester. So it it almost feels like this, this album was like a, like a like a big project, a collaborative, more of a collaborative project as well. And even with the strings players who came in to play the parts, like the strings part at the end is like, sounds like it's written by a madman. Like, this, this is definitely not a strings person writing it. So when we played it to the strings people, there's a bit in the 17th right at the beginning where it's just a little, ding -ling, like a little motif on the piano. I actually fell on the piano when it was recording. <laughs> so, but it's kind of, it's offbeat and it's out of kilter with, you know, but it sounds good. Let's create a bit more of that. And it's a bit, in the beginning of this, I don't know if you can hear it, but in the beginning of the song, it's like an out of tune harp. It's a little bit, um, A Day in the Life by the Beatles. It's a bit chaotic. It's quite quiet in the mix, but you can just about pick it out. So I wanted to carry that chaos through to the mid late. So when it all drops out, I thought, well, let's just have these sporadic kind of strange strings. And uh, that's my favourite moment on the record, I think, is the drop down of this and then going up. I mean, the lyrics, the lyrics wrote themselves, as always. But um, although I do like the OLED, someone uh, picked me up on it before it's, and they asked what it is and it's the, it's like the new screen on your phone, the OLED. Right. It's the, uh, it's the crispest of the crisp, apparently. So... Uh, I mean, I better get, be getting a new iPhone for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we, again, we've been playing this a lot live, just me and Alina on keys. And it's very delicate and it's haunting. Um, it's quite nice just me and her to have that moment on stage. But the like, but then the, the recording one is a different monster. So it, it, was, it was quite interesting to, uh, to put out in the world the mm. other day. And, and, and think, see what yeah, it's thought. totally different. Yeah. And people have just gone for the strings, and we've always, we've always had a close relationship with the strings players that have managed. I mean, they're amazing, and I have to give them so much credit because they appear so many times on the record. But it, it's there's still a small bit of me that I, I won't get ever get used to being in a room with, with musicians like that because it's it just makes you feel really, yeah, it's humbling. But I, I get so much enjoyment out of it just as a as a as a music fan of somebody watching a group of people be that good at something. I love it. I absolutely love it. It fills me with so much, like, joy. Yeah, pride. I'm allowed to say that because they're on our songs, but just listening to, like, them, them play is, is epic. And and also, there's a bit more of a conversation as well this time. I was like, well, do you think that should go there? What about if you, you know, you go from there to that or... Should we quicken that bit up and stuff? And they're really and they're great. They they ne would ne never like butt in and say, but I mean, this was this was like, what is this? What is this? But they did it and they yeah. nailed it. So, yeah, happy days. Uh, do, who are, who are they specifically? I mean, are the same people each time or? or <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh God, names. Natalie. Not names of them all, oh, but okay. is there a collective right, name yes. for the? And do you know what there is, but we're gonna have to cut that out because I can't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think they go by like the Manchester String Quartet, John, or something. Yeah, but we'll have to cut that out. So yeah, don't worry. Well, I, I'll, I'll just take out but, that question. So we don't. But, um, we, yeah. but yeah, we've we've used them. We've used the same guys for ages. Um, Natalie's the captain. She gets all the troops in line and gets them in. And they've been on. I think since maybe Anna. So they mm. played on, on like four of our records, um, and that, again they're part of the family now. We're just casting the net wider, and this happens a lot. Like you see it in bands because I think you probably gain a little bit more respect from your peers if you're still here after 12, 13 years. Yeah. It's like, aren't oh, these guys must be doing summit right? And so it's it's nicer when people kind of are more open to working with you, and I feel like more doors are open in that respect. Which that's a nice feeling because it felt like for the first few records, we were the black sheep and people didn't want anything to do with us. Which suits you when you're 21, because you're like, I was against the world. But then you just think that's such a childish attitude because you get so much more when you open your eyes and your arms and say, well, you know what? I'd much rather have 10 people in this room who are all great musicians, who've all got ideas, and let's throw it in the pot. So... I think it's such a richer um, 
experience for that. So, yeah. Yeah. And then from hanging off your cloud, um, you take the pace back up. It's previous parties, and, and this is a, an, another really heavy one, uh, a real riff monster. Yeah. Um, and it starts a whole sequence again. Yeah. Um, um, so were you thinking two sides of an LP? Yes, yeah. I think it, that was like the romantic in me. Uh, I still listen to records like that. Um, I have to say I don't... Um, it's, I probably go through, I get five to six vinyls a year, I reckon, but when you love a band, I love that. It is headphones on, where it's, you know, the national LCD. People kind of know what I'm into. You know, I've got to say, Maggie Rogers, love that record. But like, side A, flip it, side B, and I just, I don't know, I, I like starting the second side with a bit of a, bit of a monster, a bit of a like, all oh, right, okay. Again, I wrote this on the bass. I had this riff, I wrote this riff in New York, um, I wrote it in Nora Jones' flat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. So, a bit of a name drop here. Did you hear that clang then? Yeah. Clang. Yeah, amazing. Uh, yeah, used to... Like, Airbnb? Yeah. Or... <laughs> no, no. Um, we, were, we were pals and we are staying at a flat and she had a studio in a flat. Um, same room that I wrote Winter Wonderland in, actually. I did a lot of Anna in that room. Um, but I had this bass riff and it's never left me. I've always had it in the back of my mind. Um... And it was one. It was one of those things where you start sifting through your phone and your laptop, kind of when you're out of ideas or when mm. you're starting a project. Like you're just going through for a starting point. And I remember seeing that previous parties, and it was like it just. It, I'd, I'd actually tagged the baseline with the title. God knows where where that came from, but it was years ago. Um, I remember singing it to Campbell in a in a club in New York or a bar. I go to clubs, you know what I mean? Not into clubs. Especially not American clubs, they're awful. But I remember singing to Campbell like... Da, na, 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 and he was like, oh yeah. God, that sounds like a boring night out, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, so yeah, we went from there and... I get, it was a bit of a... Somewhere, I saw someone tweet that this was like De La Salle from the last record, but like De La Salle on, um, on Acid or... I can't remember what they said. Because it, like, the name checks and stuff. But that's just like a bit of... A bit of a fun that I had, I think. And... People seem to really connect with De La Salle and like the kind of characters and stuff. So it's just a bit of fun I was having with that. Mm. And again, a lot of space in the verses. Um, I think that came from s when you've got, <coughs> excuse me, so much movement in the chorus and the intro. It's really intense. So I thought I need a, you need a, the listener needs a respite there in the verses. But yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be good live. This I think. Yeah, it'd be good live. I can't wait for this one. Yeah, live. people will be screaming that live. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, and this is another rocker. I mean, side two kicks off with a bang. Previous parties. Yeah, and then into the joy of missing out. Um, and uh, what can you tell us about this one? The joy of missing out. Um, <clears throat> is it a pretty well-known phrase? This I didn't think it was when I wrote it, and like people, a few people might like. I've started to say, oh yeah. Because they have that, what is it, the fear of missing out? Yeah. This is like, this I is thought it was a play on that, on that yeah, whole promo it's the, thing. Yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah, it's like, yeah. But it's like, I don't want to do what you're doing. Stop telling me everything that you're doing. Stop telling me what your dog's doing. <laughs> you know, I know. Do you know what, though? But I'm part of the problem because I've got Instagram and I take pictures of me tea. Do you know what I mean? Right. So I'm part of the bleeding problem. But there's a difference between that and uh, the kind of what I would say there's two things that really annoy me and that's the like influence culture, influencer culture. They should all be put in cages uh, <laughs> somewhere and just fed scraps. Um, that, because it's an unrealistic lifestyle and they get everything for free and it's look at me, look at me, look at me. It's just not realistic or sustainable or I, I just think they've got like a real duty to kind of be a bit more real and honest and open about it. And the other side of it is like the kind of, I guess, like the kind of pressures that people feel under. And I don't know, people have probably heard too many songs about the pitfalls of social media. This was probably, this is a bit more just like, just fucking get on my face for a bit, you do me, I didn't. It's one of them. Musically, I've, it's, it was a bit like, I think it was my take on uh, probably trying to channel my inner rat from the Walkman. And I real up and out, I'm from the get go. Right, and um, I actually sent this to a good friend of mine who works um, who works for a label, not our label, I must add, but a different label. Um, not on a professional thing, just as like a mate, and he was like, oh, he was adamant this should, be, should have been the first single. 
He's like, it's the title of the album. Right. It's the first single. He was really excited about it. And I look, I, there's very few people that I would send stuff to. And he's one of them. And when he said that, it, it just gave me real confidence. We were probably two thirds away through the record. It gave me real confidence. And it's important that to have a little, I don't know what you want to call it, like a little family of mm. trustees that you're like, because your family are going to say it's all great. Most of your friends are going to say, most, some of your friends will say it's all shit. <laughs> most of your friends are going to say it's all great. It's good to have a couple of people you can pull on that will give you, you know, a real honest kind of thing. So that that was cool, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it, it's a charge, isn't it? It, yeah. it, it, it yeah. makes you think, yes, we're onto something. Yes, yeah, yeah. Things are going well. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's it, it's always worth trying to channel the rap by Absolutely. the woman, isn't it? I mean, try and fail, but, you know, at least, uh, you know, the effort was there. Yeah, no, it's it's great. And then you follow that with one day at a time. So you kind of take it down mm -hmm. a little. But um, this has uh, uh, surely what is going to be one of the biggest sing-along moments coming up in future Cortina's yes. shows, do you think? Yeah, it feels big. We've just started rehearsing this in the room. I'd kind of, I haven't fallen out of love with it, but I had certain songs, you probably, I probably listened to it a lot when we were mixing it and all that stuff. They fall to the bottom. We've just started rehearsing it this week and all the band are like, yeah, it's a, this will be a moment, I think. I think this goes straight into the set list, me. Straight, mm. you know, the full tour set list. This is straight in there and I think it stays there. I've not felt that for a while about something, especially a slower moment. Mm. The slow moments we tend to eschew in favour of, the faster moments, but you'd be surprised that because of that, some fast moments, faster moments, you know what I'm saying? Some of yeah, them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of those don't connect or won't connect just because that's that those are the odds, right? Whereas this one, I'm fairly sure it will connect and it, it's a slow one that will be going straight in there a bit of a moment hopefully but again i think i almost wrote this from the perspective of um the other person looking at you and kind of slow down uh, i mean it, it, it is what it is it doesn't have to really be spelled out but yeah take it slow one day at a time yeah the lyrics are there aren't they i don't really want to uh yeah yeah bore everybody yeah they're good i mean yeah, they're great i mean i when i've I've you know, been listening to it. Um, I just think, you know, it's going to happen, isn't it? I mean, the people are going to be identifying with these words and 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 singing them straight back at you. I think so, and I think it's important as well. Like I touched on, I don't know if you saw the um, there's a little documentary thing that um, a guy called Chris McCloy's John's brother from Rev from you know Reverend uh, Chris mm. has done like a little docu documentary thingy series thing. I think it's advice touching on like alcoholism and <clears throat> addiction in the music industry and stuff. I think it's important that people, uh, you know, without going too deep, see that it's all right, take a bit of time off, take a bit of time out. And also that there's loads of other people that are going through this stuff just because they're on social media, you know, with the six packs and their adverts sponsored by Starbucks and all that, like they're probably going through <clears throat> their own rabbit hole of chaos so you know don't worry about it and i just think the more people the more people touch on it no bad ever came of that no bad ever came of people you know having a chin wag so um but yeah again but also it's a it's a record so it's important to be i think through the whole for the whole album it is honest and it's heart is on its sleeve and there are some pretty dark moments but i really feel like it's pretty hopeful and optimistic actually on the whole I hope I haven't turned people off in the last hour. but I don't think so. Like, I feel like it's pretty... And it's really important to do that. Yeah. Nobody wants... I mean, look, there are, there are definite records for when you're like that, and there are records for... But I think this this feels like the, the most balanced one where I've probably been down there. There's the tough bit... Not tough bit, the, the challenge. And I think what we've done all right at this is making it sound pretty hopeful, you know, Hope through the rain, as my friend, the great prophet Robert Allen once said. So that's what, I yeah, I feel like it's pretty hopeful on the whole. So 
And, uh, and and that is typified in this song, I think, yeah. across the, the whole record. And Take It On The Chin is another upbeat number. And you know what? I mean, we've been talking about this record um, and I still don't know exactly where you recorded it. I know you've recorded and worked with a few different people mm -hmm. so far through the process mm -hmm. of writing this album. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you went to Liverpool to, to talk to Rich and, and work with Rich, but did where did you actually record? So we did it all over the place. Mm. Um, the, the main two places we did it were... In Santorini, in Greece, the world's most beautiful spot on top of a mountain, and in a car park in Newton Heath, <laughs> in East Manchester, which is not like that's a pretty good indication of this band, really. Uh, yeah, um, so yeah, there's a there's a studio in uh, Santorini called Black Rock. I, I don't know if I'm right in saying this. Maloko used to own it. They might still own it. Sorry if you do. Right. The band Maloko or the... No, the, the, the Maloko Studios. Maloko Studios, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do Maloko the band have something to do with those studios? No. Oh, no, okay. I don't That's think weird, so. No, it's like they've got a slightly different Are spelling. they named because of... No, okay. No, oh, no. Okay. They, 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 yeah, I don't right. think so. Um, yeah. There's slightly different spelling, right, isn't okay. it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, like I did a few... I only did a few days with Rich in Liverpool. Like, literally, like, mm. four, five, six days. Um... They were just like demoing and stuff and whatever. So the majority of it was in Greece and then back in Manchester. Mm. Um, but I wrote I wrote a lot of the the lyrics uh, in America on the road uh, last year. I went to... Um, I did a bit of a uh, West Coast trip, but like I went to like... I was in Portland for a while, which was the first time I'd ever been and loved it and would like go back in a heart. I'd spend a couple of months there easily and get lost. Um, and went to Yosemite as well for the first time, which which was pretty good. Well, I say it was pretty good. It was like it was literally life changing. It was just, it was so inspiring. Opening the little doors and the smell of pine and all that, and like it is mad. But you have, I, I've I've always done this. If I go away, then the notebooks are getting filled up straight away, and it's never been an issue with that. And because I kind of know that now, I don't. I relax about the words a lot more here. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So a lot of the lyrics were done when I like almost on that trip in a month. I say a lot of them, you know, like the majority of them. I do write in blocks as well. Like I'll write the majority of a song in one go. I'm not one for a phrase and then I'll go back to it later on. I do a lot like that <clears throat> uh, all in one. But then I will do a lot of, the, especially this record, the most actually is like editing and going back and, I used to feel like that was cheating. <laughs> I used to be like, oh, you can't, you've got that, that's the lyric, that's how it's staying. But I'm a lot more, I just, do you know what? I spent too long actually, but every word, every rhyme, and not just rhymes at the end of the words, trying to get them in the middle of the, you know, middle of the lines. And um, yeah, I took a lot more uh, care over the wordplay this time. Um, so the, the words were done there. Yeah, Greece was was pretty amazing. We went over there. I think we were there for three weeks. The first week, we got a lot done. Weeks two and three, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, don't put five Mancunians on a plane to a sunny place and say, come back with ten songs. <laughs> it just isn't going to happen. Uh, when when was this? <clears throat> it, was when, it was when the World Cup was on. Right. <laughs> so I think the World Cup started in, like, when... Like in week two, so the the work rate, the work rate. I mean, it, it nosedived dramatically. Um, but do you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's not an office job, is it? So, um, <laughs> but it, it, I mean, you know, it was fun. Um, still paying for it now. Um, but I think it's important to go and experience those things. And like, look, it wasn't the Mondays where we went for six months and we came back two million in the hole. But. Um, why not? Like, if you can get to a place like that where you're forgetting the kind of, you know, the mundane and, you know, not thinking about what day you've got to put the bins out, it just elevates your, maybe not even creativity, but confidence, and then that feeds into the creativity. And um, I mean, I had a big year, and, you know, Conan needed the top of his tan. <laughs> so off off we went buckets and spades got packed um, we had a good time do you know what as well those two weeks where we didn't get a lot done 
probably informed some of the lyrics and, you know, other bits of, you know, when we came back and stuff. So, yeah. And so there's a place in Manchester that we sometimes use, in fact, we use it a lot, called 80 Hertz. And it's in a building called the Sharp Project and it's called so because it's where the old Sharp factory was. So you remember when United used to have Sharp across the thing, so straight away I was like, oh, we've got to do it there. That's just a, it's a, it's a absolutely beautiful studio, to be honest. And George, the guy who runs it, is as close to a legend as you can get. Um, so we've done loads of bits and bobs there over the years. It's a really nice studio. Kind of overlooked as well a lot. I don't know why. If you're outside of London, I, I would use that all the time. Mm. Um, it's a great live room. Um, so we did a lot of it there. And then a lot of the bits and bobs tidying up, me and, me and Joe just did that at his little studio. Um, but again, like, lots of back and forth with this. Loads of tiny edits. Oh, you know what? This is so boring. I don't know if it is boring talking about it. Mate, I don't know if I'm boring I don't know. myself. Pe pe people like some of this stuff, I, I guess think the, so. I guess but, they you know, do. I mean, I just wanted to know, just because so, it's, it's it's interesting hearing the different people that um, you've worked with on the record. Mm. You know, the idea that you kind of opened up um, yeah. yourself to to other people mm. and and this whole process and the, the evolution of the work of Liam Frey <laughs> is always interesting to anybody who's interested in the Cortina. So, no, I think it is interesting. But we take it on the chin. Um, you take it back up. You've got Got some family advice that the characters mentioned in Take It on the Chin? Are they, yeah. are they uh, real people? Uh, Is it Auntie no. Kathleen? Yeah, Auntie Kathleen, retired maths queen. I realised when, when I'd done it, it sounded like maths queen, like she was going to church, and then that fed into another lyric. So maybe it should have been maths queen, but it is maths queen, because I just thought, uh, yeah, oh, that's a weird one. No, that's not real. I do have an Auntie Kathleen, I used to, rest us all, but it's not her. Um, just in case any family members are wondering and you're going to put it in the WhatsApp group, don't bother. Um, <laughs> again, this is like, I was having some fun with this, but probably the darkest lyrical matter, I guess. Um, again, being told to like, man up and all that, you know, like, get to, don't tell me to man up. Like, you don't tell anyone if they want to have a chat and they need to get some out of the chest. You should be telling people that you've got ears and you're going to listen to them. So, I think things like the football doing that one minute past three, it was derided a little bit <clears throat> by certain things, but everyone was talking about it. I think football was coming out as a big thing and talking about it. Mm. Um, I know Merson said something the other day about it, and, you know, Danny Rose from Spurs has said stuff. I think that's really important. Yeah, high-profile people like that saying that they've had issues and stuff gets people chatting, doesn't it? Um, but... On the flip side, it's a big tune. This, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's that's it, isn't it? If you can do it and 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 kind of alleviate it with it's, you know a bit of sense of humour and and uh, I don't know. I really like this. I love the solo in the middle. Um, very Nick Valenci from the Strokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can say that, I'm not. I mean, you know, twenty percent Valenci. <laughs> um, but we, oh, I mean, this is boring, but we spent ages getting the drum sound on this because we wanted it to be sound just like the strokes, the hi-hat. It's very tight and it's very tinny. So, yeah, they've done a great job on getting the, and the drums like that. I think um, I think Rich had a hand in that as well as Joe, actually. There was a lot of discussion about this drum sound. We did this in... in uh, did, where did we do this? I think, was, I think this we've recorded this song in about four different places. This is de this is a, a real mashup. This one right. of different takes and different whatever. But um, again, it, I think it'll be good live. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you've set yourself a task, haven't you? With you know, ten very different songs, but ten potential live anthems yeah. in different kind of ways. And and then how do you include all of those <clears throat> in in the set? It's get, when get, you've got it's like get, five other albums. Yeah, worth. it's getting harder and. Yeah, it's it's obviously it's a nice problem to have, isn't it? Mm. But um, this feels like the strongest one, probably we've ever done. Where like the last couple, you go, okay, those three will work, that's fine. This feels like I've play almost all of it. Um, so, but again, we're doing these little shows, these little album launch shows, where we'll get get to do most of it, I guess. Mm. So that's a good way of gauging as well yeah. what works and what doesn't. So. Yeah, those are those are ideal, aren't they? Yeah. So then the album ends with "Is Heaven Even Worth It?" Oh yeah, yeah. So you know you you kind of slow things down again. Yeah. Um, to round things off. Mm -hmm. And um, d where did this come in? Philosophical in... cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah. This is it. <laughs> I know it's a big question. 
Um, we're listening to some like a lot of massive attack as well. Um, and just just lifted that beat to be honest with you. Just thought that sounds epic. In fact, it doesn't sound epic. I'm gonna stop saying that. It almost sounds the opposite. It sounds very, uh, it sounds delicate and introspective. And um, but this is uh, I we did this. I did this with uh, Rich uh, in one of those ses early sessions. Oh, I did. Uh, yeah, I did the majority of it, I think. And again, it came very quickly. I love the lyric. When I first wrote this, I thought it's not a Cortina song. I was gonna uh, repay the favor to um to Hertz, and I thought about texting Theo and saying this would be a great because I imagined the chorus being massive and like I don't even know what the hell. do you know what I mean and, and all that. And I thought I can't sing like that, no chance. So I just sung it low and thought. This would be a song for someone. I, I genuinely, when I'd written it, I thought that's for someone else. I played it to the band and they really liked it. So I was like, okay. And it fit, and it, you know, the kind of... I, I do still think of a record as a as a real, you know, uh, um, you know, beginning, middle and end. Mm. And once they said they liked it, I was like, oh, it's got to be the last track then. It just feels a bit... I don't know. It feels like it leaves it on... I think it should leave it on a question rather than like... Patting yourself on the back, going, "Oh, that was fun, wasn't it?" It's almost like I don't know. <laughs> I've got more questions than I have answers after listening to that. <laughs> but I like that. Yeah, no, totally. Has Theo heard it? Has you know? I, I like the do idea of Hertz doing a version. I do actually. No, but I know that they're doing stuff for the next record now. At the minute, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Well, I just did, so they won't mind. I think they're in the demo stages. But um, he hasn't um, heard it yet. Um, well, as soon as the band said they liked it, I was like, thank God I didn't send it. <laughs> I was like, yeah. glad, I'm, gl late. I'm glad that email bounced back. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I mean, it's it's been brilliant having you here tonight, thank you, Liam. Um, Always a pleasure. Thanks for coming in. And and the interesting thing is, is now it's 2020. It is kind of four years since the last album, which mm. I, I hadn't hadn't quite sunk in that it had been that long because you'd not gone away. No. No, you've been around and gigging we did and that. playing we these did the massive same shows. We did thing, didn't we? The kind of reissue where we, we did yes, it acoustically. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So I think we, we did like bits and bobs around that and then a couple of festivals and, it was, you know, last year was our biggest year ever. and Because it, it, we haven't had time almost off to kind of think about it. Like it just keeps rolling on... And I think as long as we keep it interesting, then there's no need to have like three years off, off, if you know what I mean. Mm. So uh, one thing I will say though, is that just slightly to go back to the record, which is the first time I've done a record, because I think people will find this interesting. Oh, fingers crossed, I don't know, they probably hate it. It's the first time I've done a record whilst we have been gigging and doing festivals. And it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a different mindset because you're on stage and you're watching people going bananas to like, I don't know, Notion or Cavorting. And then you're coming off and trying to write more again forever mm. and do this thing that's completely different. So you're going, what are we doing here? It's suicide, this. What are we doing? You know, it could be, um, no one could be into this. So that was a bit weird. We've never done that before. Yeah. And, and it, it sounds like you wouldn't necessarily yeah. want to do that again. I don't think so, but then I don't know because the records turned out really good. Yeah. So sod what came, sod what you felt like or what came before. All people are bothered about is those 10 songs. To be honest, that's all I'm bothered about as well. Look, it's a bit of a pain in the backside to do it. So what? That's good in a way. Keeps you on your toes and... and um, and also, my work ethic is pretty horrific. So to get me in a studio for six weeks non-stop, it's just going to <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know how you can say that. When, um, <laughs> you know, six albums in, you're playing to 50,000 people uh, uh, on these big shows mm. and and you haven't really gone away, as, as we've yeah, said. I, I, guess, know, so I guess... It sounds I guess, to me like you've got a good work ethic. Yeah, I, you know, I do I, a three-day week, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> Um, thanks again, Liam. Great to have Very you welcome. here. Thanks, mate. And uh, congratulations. Cheers. On more again forever. Radio X.